begin with a confession. It wasn't Reese's fault. It wasn't Josh's fault. It wasn't even the equipment's fault. I didn't have my pack turned on. That's why it wasn't working. Praise the Lord that it's all of this is up to him and not uh, me, right? So, well, again, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter six as we bring Paul's instructions regarding the armor of God to somewhat of a close. Um, we'll spend this week and next week in 18 through 20, and then we will uh, finish in a few weeks with his final greetings. But again, I apologize if it seems like I'm beating a dead horse. Well, sort of. I don't really. But it is important for us to understand and to be reminded that the overall command of this, this section is to stand. It's given to us five different times in just the first five verses. We are to stand against not flesh and blood, but against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. These are the things Paul says that we are to stand against. These forces are certainly behind the sin and evil that ravage this physical world, but we need to make sure we know where the battle line is, where we are to make a stand and where we are to fight. And if we are to stand, we are to use these very resources, the armor that is supplied by the person and work of our leader, Jesus Christ. These spiritual, heavenly issued pieces of armor prepare us, they equip us to stand in this life against the very things which, if they aren't stood against, will cause us, will cause the believer to waver, to falter, to slip and slide and not please and glorify God. Again, please note that Paul is not making this a salvific issue, but a sanctification issue, a stand issue. In Psalm 1, we're given the picture of the man that Paul is really trying to help us be. The psalmist writes in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. See, the, bear, the armor-bearing Christian is the tree that is planted by streams of water. It's the, he's the, he or she is the tree that bears fruit. The tree does not wither, but prospers. The armor-bearing Christian does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not flirt with sin. He doesn't listen to the unwise, ungodly words of the wicked. In fact, they make no sense to him because the perspective, the, the worldview of the wicked is so unlike the righteous man, it's silly to him. He doesn't listen because it's nonsense. The righteous man sees and responds to reality, sees and responds to truth not some made-up, man-produced ideology that encourages godlessness. We also see he does not stand in the way of sinners. The Christian armed with the armor of God can spot worldliness right away. He or she can discern the ways of the world and avoid them. This man not only does not do the things of the world, but he does the godly thing. Nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers. This righteous person, this righteous man in Psalm 1 is also very uncomfortable with those who mock God. He's not okay with his own sin, and he certainly is not okay with those who oppose God and his ways. Worldliness is not appealing to this person. But this man delights in God's word. He delights to do God's will. He delights in the God of the word. And the psalmist gives us a very stark contrast between the righteous and the wicked. 
And the writer is, is helping us see this. He's helping the believer who is already known by God walk in the ways of the righteous, to walk in the ways of the favored. So that's what Paul is attempting to do in Ephesians 6. He is helping us be this righteous person that the psalmist is writing about. You are already a tree if you are saved. You are already a soldier. So now Paul says, put this armor on so that you might stand, so that your roots might sink deep into the nourishing soil of Christ and his word, so that you might bear fruit and not wither in drought, so that you might remain tall and strong in the storms of life. And Paul says, these are the pieces of equipment that you need in order to be this person. And now, after instructing us to put these spiritual pieces of armor on, this morning Paul comes to the one thing that brings it all together. The one thing that makes sure all these other pieces of armor will be effective and useful. And he tells us to pray. And now there are some who attempt to put prayer in the same category along with the rest of these pieces of armor. Uh, some say that prayer is, is the final aspect of the Christian armor that's to be put on so that they might stand. And if I'm honest with you, that's where I would have been before I started this study. But I'm sure as you've noticed, Paul does not illustrate this final instruction Along, he doesn't do it the same way as he does the other pieces of armor. There are other attempts to put prayer alongside of just the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, leaving out the other pieces of armor that are to be used and put on with prayer. Again, I, I think the context is helpful for us in knowing where these final verses belong. We are to stand... And Paul gives us these specific pieces of spiritual armor so that we can and will obey. But as we notice, or as we will notice, prayer is a little bit different. I think we're looking at a little bit of a sandwich here in verses 10 to 20. And we're finally coming to the second slice of bread. Paul is, in a sense, taking us back up to verse 10. If you remember, Paul began this section by saying, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Stand might be the overarching command and desire for us from Paul, but the one ingredient, the one necessity that ensures and guarantees success in this standing is this command, be strong in the Lord. So you and I, we can put on all these pieces of armor and we can go marching around in this life with the belt of truth on, the breastplate of righteousness fastened, the shoes of the gospel of peace tied snug, the shield of faith in arm, the helmet of salvation on our heads, wielding the sword of the Spirit, and we can still fail miserably because we're not standing or being strong in the Lord and in His strength and in His might. I fear many of us move quickly past verse 10 and we stop at verse 17 and we wonder why in the world is my belt loose? Why is my breastplate thin? Why are my shoes untied? Why am I slipping? Why, why is my shield too small? Why is my helmet too uncomfortable? And why is my sword so dull? This life beats us around and we're tossed to and fro by every emotion, every new fad or popular book, every trial, every temptation. We find ourselves fearing man and not God. We find ourselves loving the praise of those who oppose God. We love this world more than Jesus and his ways. His desires are not our desires and we battle fear and discontentment and struggle loving him and his people. So Paul brings us back. He's reminding us of the most basic foundational truth in all of this. All of this must be done in his strength. A fly swatter will do you no good at Normandy. Nuclear war will not be won with a BB gun. And Paul is telling us that the secret to all of this 
The secret to using these pieces of armor is the strength of the Lord and in his might. But how is this done, believer? How do we do this practically? How is it that we stand in his strength? How do we as sinful people accomplish this? Well, you don't. And Paul says that's why we must pray. Remember Peter? Peter attempted to walk with the Lord in his own strength. Luke gives us this account of Peter in the 22nd chapter of his gospel. In verses 31 to 34 of Luke 22, Luke tells us of this conversation, this, this statement that Jesus makes to Peter. Jesus tells us, or tells Peter, that Satan has requested to sift you like wheat. And the sifting will be so intense, Peter, that you will deny me three times within the next several hours. However, upon hearing these words of Jesus, as Peter thinks that he can resist. He's not like Judas who just left. Peter didn't think there was any possible way that he would fall away. And Judas had just walked out the door and now Satan was going to attempt to knock off the second of the twelve. And Jesus tells Peter, Peter, the schemes of the devil are on their way. The spiritual forces of evil are knocking at the gates of the palace. And what does Peter do? What does Peter rely on? Whose strength and might is Peter going to attempt to be strong in? Read on to verses 39 through 46, and we're given the answer. As Jesus and these men arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus has just a few more hours to prepare his will in prayer. And so he instructs the others to pray as well. He says in verse 40, pray that you may not enter into temptation. So imagine the situation with me here. Here's Peter. Just hearing from the Son of God himself that he was going to be sifted by Satan. Peter would just witnessed Jesus sending Judas away. And Peter just heard Jesus tell him to pray that he, so that he may not fall into temptation. And here's Peter. Not watchful. Not fearful. Not humble. But overconfident. He's self-reliant and self-assured, relying on his own strength and might taking a nap when Jesus returns. We all know what happened in verses 54 to 62. Peter did in fact deny Jesus. And it wasn't from the pressure of the ignorant, arrogant Jewish leaders. This denial was enforced on him by some big scary Roman soldier. But it was a young Servant girl that caused Peter to deny being with and knowing Jesus. Peter was attempting to stand and be strong in his own strength and might. He did not pray. Peter thought that there was no way he would ever be like Judas. He believed that he had the power and strength to stand and to even die for Jesus. And so he slept instead of praying. He satisfied the physical instead of strengthening the spiritual. And this is not a lesson on praying more and sleeping less, but it does prove that Paul's point that the battle is not physical, but it is spiritual. And so Paul begins to teach these men and women in Ephesus that prayer is the primary way that they stand in, the, in Christ's strength, and it is through prayer in which we apply all the spiritual armor so that we might stand in the strength of the Lord. Prayer is what tightens your belt, believer. Prayer is what tightens or what makes the breastplate of righteousness protective. Prayer is what makes the gospel of peace fit and snug on your feet so you don't slip and trip on the loose ground. It's prayer that makes the shield of faith sound and solid and sure so that we can deflect and extinguish the fiery darts of Satan. It's what makes us think rightly about our salvation. It's what makes the words of scripture powerful and sharp. And so Paul says, put on all of these pieces of armor. Yes, every one of them, they are completely necessary and are issued by your leader, but they will only be as effective as they are used in the strength and might of the Lord as opposed to your own. 
Peter says, or Paul says, so pray. So this morning, let's stand together and let's read once again this section of Scripture as we continue to see and understand what Paul has for us. Ephesians 6, again reading verses 10 through 20. Paul says, Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, I confess that there is much for me to work on in this passage. And so Lord, I pray that you would help us all to see the glorious privilege and our great need for prayer. Oh Lord, that we would not come to it hesitantly, begrudgedly, but anxiously, excitedly, hopefully. Help us to understand the truths that you have for us this morning. Pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So beginning there in verse 18, where we'll find ourselves this morning, our instruction is really focused around three different words. The first two are kind of buddies. It's the word prayer or pray and the word supplication or petition in the NAS or the, the LSB. And we'll get to the difference between these two thoughts in just a bit, but these two words are used four different times in these three verses, indicating, giving a strong indication that this is Paul's point. He's calling us to speak to God. He's calling these men and women to stand, to be strong in the Lord through prayer. And this is his emphasis and point. The third word, used again four different times in these verses, is the word that we translate all. This indicates the comprehensiveness, the, the thoroughness, the intensity of prayer that Paul is calling us to. And it's really this word that we're going to build our outline around this morning. And with this, we're going to see four directives regarding prayer that help us see how comprehensive or how comprehensive and, and life dominating prayer should be for the believer so that we might be strong in the Lord and in his strength and his might. First of all, we, Paul says there, praying at all times in the spirit. The Greek of this phrase is more along the lines of praying at every opportunity. Paul's telling these believers in us here today that we are to use every opportunity to pray. I think that many of us here this morning would agree that Prayer is something that we could work at, corporately and personally. David McIntyre, in a little book that he wrote, 
says this, he says, the prince of the power of the air seems to bend all the force of his attack against the spirit of prayer. And if he should prove victorious there, he has won the day. See, I believe if we truly understood that the battle is spiritual, we would be on our knees much more. And as I was thinking through this, this week, why is it that I don't pray as I should? There are quite a few reasons and we won't get into all of those. But I think there are really two reasons that were very obvious to me and I think that they might be for many of you as well. I think the first one is we don't pray as much as we should because we don't realize we need to pray. We often talk about how, things, how hard things are today. We talk about how the church is beginning to be persecuted more and more in America. We talk about the attack on male, male leadership, on marriage, the nuclear family, the rise of inflation, progressivism, the degrading value of human life, and just really the all-out opposition to God. And all those things are true. They are real. But what we need to remember that many of these things that we just spoke of were close to at their height in a lot of ways in this Ephesian culture. We talked about the culture of marriage and how wives and children were treated. We know that the culture in Ephesus was very much opposed to God. In fact, towards the end of the first century, there would be a law for anyone living in the Roman Empire to confess that Caesar is Lord, not Jesus is Lord. And so when Paul says this, that that every situation is an opportunity to pray, these men and women would have understood the urgency of prayer. They would have understood the urgency of this statement. They would be living in the reality of their need for prayer. And I fear that, one, the church today is not that much of a praying church, and two, the Christian today is not that much of a praying Christian. And I certainly don't say that out of any kind of attitude or thought that I'm any different. I believe that part of it comes from the ease and comfort that we have in our lives. We truly don't have a lot of trials and persecutions. I believe there's a lack of hatred of sin, a lack of understanding of God's holiness. There's a love for the world and all of this leads us to think that things are going pretty good, that things are okay that there really isn't that much of a battle going on, and so we think that we're handling things pretty good on our own. A Christian today can stand on the edge of the river and not be affected by the strong current of the culture. The Christian today thinks in many ways that they can remain neutral and not ruffle many feathers, and so we think we don't have to pray. In many ways, we find ourselves like Peter. We think things are going just all right. And even though we may not outright deny Jesus like he did, we do when we don't stand. And yeah, we certainly may not be Judas, but in many ways, we are Peter. And many times, it's much less than a young servant girl causing us to deny him. We don't pray because we stay away from the front lines in the heat of the battle. We don't fear sin, so we allow it to hang around. We don't love truth, so we waver on it. We have weak faith, so we get hit with Satan's arrows. Our salvations become more about us than about the glory of God, so we walk around with a concussion. We're weaponless because at some point we put the sword down and we don't know where to find it. We don't see and understand each and every situation in life as an opportunity to stand. Not just trials and temptations, but every day we walk out to the grocery store, to the workplace, to the school, or to the playground, or in our neighborhoods. Everything is an opportunity to honor and glorify God. Everything is an opportunity to stand. He brings everything our way every realm of life that he's put us in, we are to use as an opportunity for this. 
Many times we don't live lives that require us to be strong in the Lord. I think a lack of prayer is evident that we're trying to stand on our own strength and might. Therefore, we don't think there's a need. See, it's in prayer where we put our own efforts to the side and we rely wholly upon the one who's already conquered. He is the one who has already defeated the enemy. He is the one who has already stood. He is the one who is strong. And so we need to pray. And if we don't realize that need, then we may not be standing. We may not even be fighting. The second reason I believe we should see every situation as an opportunity to pray is that prayer is a great and glorious privilege for us. Again, David McIntyre, who I mentioned earlier, little book is A Hidden Life of Prayer. Very helpful in describing the mindset that we should have as we enter into prayer. He says that understanding the great privilege of prayer for us begins by realizing that in prayer we are entering into the presence of the holy, righteous, creator king of the universe. We are doing something that would bring us death if we attempted this in the ancient Near East. To enter the throne room of a king would have got your head lopped off. How much more holy, how much more righteous is the throne room of God? This then leads us to understand how it is that we are invited into this throne room without dying. Because this great privilege came at a great cost to Christ. Secondly, then, we enter not clothed in our own filthy, dirty, rotten robes, but in the perfect, clean, righteous robes of Jesus that he graciously clothes us in. The perfection of our Lord is imputed to us. It is as if we had obeyed in every way. It is as if we are righteous and blameless and perfect, which in him we are. And it is because of this alone we can enter into this throne room of the king of the universe. And thirdly then, we enter not as peasants or subjects, but as sons and daughters. We enter with boldness and confidence into the king's throne room, who is now our father. This does not mean we do this flippantly or irreverently, but knowing that we will be heard and accepted as a father listens and receives his very own children. We will not be turned away or ignored. He will care what we say and will answer for our good and his glory. And brothers and sisters, I often forget this great and glorious privilege. Do we go to him first or is prayer the last and the least thing we can do? Do we go to him before the trial or do we use him as the last resort when all of our own resources have been used up? And do we long for this? Do we understand who it is that we get to speak to each and every day? Do we take each and every opportunity to go to the holy omnipotent creator of the universe and lay our cares and concerns before him. Our fears and our worries, our sins and our hard hearts, our joys and our hopes, our trials and temptations, do we lay all of those before him knowing and trusting that he alone will act. He alone can and will give us the strength to stand, to be and respond in ways that bring him glory and honor and that make us more like him. Do we look like the little children running into the arms of their dad when he gets home from work? Or do we look more like the child who's dragging his feet because he has to take the trash out or mow the yard? It just might be, brothers and sisters, that the situation you find yourself in is caused by him so that you will go to him. And I confess, I often think that I can solve it on my own. I can work through this because I'm strong enough. 
And we do have to make sure we see that Paul says that this prayer should be in the Spirit. Please don't understand Paul to be saying that there has to be some sort of mystical, emotional experience when we pray in order for it to be effective. Paul used this similar language in chapter 5, verse 18, when he told us, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we look through that verse, we learn that this filling is, is, is a controlling or a dominating life in accordance to the Spirit, which is in accordance with the very word that this third person of the Trinity inspired. Therefore, the same is true with our prayers. When we pray in the Spirit, we are to enter, we are enter into not some higher realm of consciousness, but we enter into the realm of reality. We enter into truth. We pray in line with the Word. We are to want what the Spirit wants. We are to want what God wants. We are to want whatever is going on to be for our good and His glory. And it is the Spirit that helps us go to Him at all times and in every opportunity knowing we need Him. And it is a great and awesome privilege to do so. Brothers and sisters, pray at all times. Every situation calls for us to pray. And Paul's next all helps us with this. Paul says to not only pray at all times, but our praying should be with all prayer and supplication. Here it is where Paul uses these two different words to further explain what he means by pray. The first word is translated prayer. It's, it's the more general. It, it gives the idea of any communication or speaking to God. It, it can and does involve praise and thanksgiving and confession and requesting or supplication. But the second word, supplication, it's also translated petition. This is more of a specific word. It carries the idea of to plead or to beg. It's to bring your cares and your concerns, your, your struggles and sins, your sorrow and pain, your, your fear and your worries, your trials and temptations to Him and plead with Him to help you be strong and to stand. It's to lay your thoughts and issues out at His feet and to beg of Him to work in you and through you whatever is going on. And when we do this, we are acknowledging our need and His abundant supply. We are acknowledging our weakness in His power. We are acknowledging our inability and His omnipotence, our helplessness in His might. There's been quite a bit of effort throughout church history to try to help us understand how it is or what we are to look like when we pray. In 1550, there was a group of godly church leaders who met in Essex, England to discuss the posture of prayer according to Scripture. Should it be done standing up? Should it be done kneeling? Should our heads be covered or uncovered? Should it be done in public or private? And as they discussed Scripture regarding this issue, they, they wisely came to the conclusion that the physical posture has nothing to do with prayer, but it is heart posture that the Word of God addresses. And this is what Paul is telling us in this letter as well. To go to God and pray. That there's no specific formula. Some like lists, others treat lists like a legalistic checks the box ritual. Others pray out loud, some pray silent. Some are short prayers, some are long. There are public prayers and there are private. Each time, brothers and sisters, you sit down, you do not need to follow the Acts outline of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication type of formula. I'm not saying that's not bad. But if every circumstance is to be an opportunity to pray, then you may not have time to work all through these things. You may not be in the situation where you can follow that. And Paul says, whatever and whenever, pray. So whether your prayer is formal or informal, whether it's long or short, thought out or sudden, praise or confession, out loud or silent, secret or public, our prayer should be with a humble posture, a humble posture of the heart, knowing that we are invited into the presence of the King 
who is our Father. And we're to lay before Him our needs. And we need that. So Paul calls us to use every situation and circumstance as an opportunity to pray. When we do this, we are to use any and every type of prayer. And now thirdly, Paul tells us to be persistent in prayer, to make an effort to pray. Paul says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Now, two initial notes on this phrase. First, what does end mean? What is he referring to? And this phrase could also and is also rendered with this in view or for this purpose. And Paul again is just taking us back to the reason why we should pray. It's necessary to pray so that we might be strong in the Lord at the moment of attack. Therefore, it is that reason why we must be alert. Secondly then, what does Paul mean by alert? What does it mean as if Paul, it almost seems as if Paul's changing directions here. Alert can also be translated watch or be vigilant. The command to pray and to be alert, however, oftentimes teamed together. In Mark's account of the Garden of Gethsemane, we're told that Jesus told the disciples, he commanded the disciples to watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He says, be alert and pray. Harold Honer claims that Prayer is for the purpose of maintaining alertness. Prayer causes alertness, and alertness keeps believers in prayer. So being in prayer and being alert are brothers. They're close relatives. So before, in the first two points, Paul says, pray whenever a need arises, and pray however the circumstance allows but now coupled with this continual alertness, we are to have a disposition of being persistent in prayer at all times. Paul says this to the Colossians in Colossians 4.2. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it. No good soldier or no soldier that wants to stay alive falls asleep in the midst of heavy fighting. There's a persistent alertness of the dangers around him and his fellow soldiers. The fight is understood, and knowing what he is in the midst of is vital to his survival. I think many people at this point would go to the story of the persistent widow found in Luke 18. If you remember this parable, Jesus teaches us of a widow who is being treated unjustly, and so she goes to the judge in her city. And for a period of time, the, this evil, arrogant judge refuses to help this widow out. But she persisted. She kept going back and going back and going back and laying her case before him until finally the judge rules on her behalf and he gives her justice. And in Luke 18, verse 7, Jesus says this, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And I think many times we hear this preached or, or taught or referred to in order to encourage persistence in prayer, which Jesus is teaching that. He desires for us to cry to him day and night. But not so that we get what we want, but so that he gets what he wants. This justice that this widow called for is not promised in any measure until he returns. And then it will be accomplished speedily for those who have faith. And we have to be careful not to make this or take this parable too far. We are called to be persistent in prayer, but not persistence to beat the judge down so that we get what we want. We have to know 
And we know this because there's many examples where persistence in prayer brings a different answer than what is being asked for. Remember Paul. Paul prayed three times for this thorn in his flesh to be removed. Something was going on in Paul's life that was causing discomfort. It was causing angst. It may be sickness. Some believe it could be his eyesight. Others believe it was a, a certain person. Now, he wasn't married, so ladies, you can relax. But we don't know for sure. But we do know that Paul prayed persistently for it to be removed from him. But the answer was not, okay, okay, Paul, since you're persistent, I'll, I'll remove this. The answer was, I'm going to leave this thorn because, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And because this was the answer, we later read in Paul's letters that he learned contentment in all things. We learn that Paul says he could do all things through the grace that strengthened him. See, the answer that Paul was given is what was best for Paul and it's what most glorified Christ. We see that another example is in Jesus when Jesus prayed persistently three times that there might be some other way for the Father's wrath to be satisfied. Some other way that, that his people could be redeemed with having, without having to become sin and drink the fullness of the Father's wrath. And the answer was no. Jesus, this is the only way. And we know that Judas came. Jesus was arrested Pilate had him beaten and hung on the cross. The father treating him as if he was you or I by pouring out his wrath and judgment on him. That was for our good. It was for his glory. See, our persistence does not guarantee ease and comfort and immediate justice. Paul doesn't claim, he's not claiming here in Ephesians that persistence will convince God to give you what you are asking for. He won't always take the pain or the trial away. The heat and the heaviness of the temptation might not be removed, but our persistence does bring us into a closer fellowship and communion with God, and in this, we are strengthened by him and his might. It conforms us and our wills to his. And it helps us bear up under and resist the urge to give in or fall or retreat. I think this is maybe where we need to stop this morning. We'll finish this section up next week with the final point. There are some helpful things for me to think through this week. I think every good, solid Bible believing, or even in good, solid Bible believing hearts and homes and churches, I think we can get off a bit in our theology in one area in my own personal life that shows me where I'm getting a bit off and thinking wrongly and incorrectly about God is my prayer life. In our context this morning and in all of Ephesians 6, I think we can see where our actions or lack of actions show us error in our thinking and application of truth. See, I can stand here and I can, I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that God is intimately involved in our lives. He doesn't just give, save us and then turn us out into the pasture and let us figure it out on our own. He doesn't just expect us to obey and stand by ourselves. And I can tell you with great confidence and conviction how much that I still need him every day and every hour. But if you were to observe my prayer life and heard my prayers, I, 
I think sometimes you would wonder if I truly believe those things. Sometimes I think practically we live and pray as if we can do all of this by ourselves. That we don't need his strength and might because we don't go to him for it and rely on him for it. See, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that every situation is an opportunity to go to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and pray, to speak to him, to lay our burdens down at his feet, to ask him to strengthen us for each and everything that he brings our way. What a privilege this is. What a privilege to go to him with our every need. And it needn't always be formal and driven by a list. And more times, times than not, we need, not, we need to seek his face more than we seek his hand so that we might have our hearts and minds transformed into his likeness. And in that, there's great hope and strength. We can't believe the lie. We can't just think that just because we've been given a belt and a breastplate and shoes and a shield and a helmet and a sword that we have any ability to stand on our own. All of this continues to rest in the fact that we must stand in his strength and might in one of those ways in which we know whose strength we're relying on is our prayer life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we would continually go to you with our needs, with our praises, with our thanks, with our supplications, with our confession. And Lord, through that, you would give us the ability, that you would give us the strength to stand. That the truths, the reality of who you are and the, the, the truths of what you have done for us and how those work practically out in our lives, that you would use those in us to bring glory and honor to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.